the biggest advice I've been given is look for moments over edits mm. um, and and things that are very emotion driven. And I think that's what we like to pull from from video and photo is sharing emotion. And so when we're working with things that might be more serious, if you can drive and produce and pull that emotion from somebody, that's a successful product. <laughs> Welcome. This is a unique opportunity in Beyond the Game to talk to someone who really is not necessarily beyond the game, but also behind the game. Because Cade Carroll is a video videographer, hard to say for an old guy like me, videographer for BYU and other things. Cade, tell us a little bit about what you do in video videography. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I currently work in uh, the sports industry for BYU Athletics as a videographer. So anything that hits social platforms comes from me and my team. And then occasionally I freelance on the side, um, which covers all things such as photos for clients, family photos, senior stuff, but then some video work. Um, worked with a few companies. Cool. So, yeah. I have a question. You know, I've seen so many really cool videos from the BYU athletic department. And a lot of times there are also other things like the Cougar Ants or, or Cosmo. I mean, do you get involved in that too, or is it always just sports related? Yeah. Um, actually I went to Europe with the Cougar Ants for about two weeks. Oh summer. my heavens. So. Wow. That yeah. hadn't, I mean, is there hair jumping around all over the place when you're in Europe, you know, as well? Oh Yeah. The hair's always in the face. Hard to get a good picture of, of them smiling because hair's in it the face. It is amazing what they're able to do, isn't it? Yeah, it's crazy. And then Cosmo, able to dance with them like that. Yeah, so last last football season, um, that was actually my role, was like covering Cosmo, his stunts, wow. and things that he did. That's cool. And then we kind of shifted things in the office. So if we're kind of having a poor season, you know, we can kind of concentrate on these other things that are successful at BYU. Yeah. Tell me what sports are your favorite sports or that you've been working with the most um, le lately? Yeah, on honestly, picking a favorite sport's hard for me. I like the variety. I think being stuck with one team in practice, they run the same you know, three-point drill or the same progressions in football. It's like, how do I make this look different? Where my role, I've really enjoyed being able to one day I'm at soccer practice, and then the next day I'm at baseball and, and other things. So I've really enjoyed that to have the variety for myself, but then to allow um, different creative outlets with like video work and things like that. Um, so as far as like my favorite, I think soccer this year has been one of my favorites just because of the, the points we've put up. Like, I mean, seven goals in one of the games I went to where usually, and looking across the board in the NCAA, like, the scores of the games are 1-0, one, 1-1, one, one. right. And so that was fun because there was a lot of action. And so I think that's what I like about um, with, with like football, basketball, is there's something happening every play or drive. And compared to soccer, it's kind of a lot of back and forth and then praying that you're able to capture the one goal of the game. Where this season it's been a little bit different for me. I've been able to capture – a lot of goals and take risks on certain things because I know we're up 5-0 right now. I'm going to go try from over here, things like that. What about videography in other sports is enjoyable for you? When I went into accounting, later I decided and I got a master's degree in accounting, and I said, you know what? I don't like being a photographer. I want to be on the field playing. You know, That was just my personality, and to me – an accountant was on, you know, on the sidelines taking pictures and then proving everything, you know. And so I'm not putting down photography. In fact, it's a phenomenal need that we have everywhere. But tell me your passion for videography. Yeah, I mean. Now that I've put it down. I mean, yeah. 
<laughs> now let me prove you why it's better. No, good, good. No, really, serious. Um, I think, I mean, where it all started from was a bunch of my buddies in like seventh grade really wanted to make videos and they were kind of more on like the Hollywood side and like action effects and things like that. But it was just fun to be around the nature of a camera and with my friends. Um, but that still kind of wasn't my line of work and you know I was never good at being in front of the camera I'm not a very good actor and so I would always be behind whether it was like holding a microphone or things like that um, and then there's one moment in particular that like kind of sparked my interest where like we were you know people had left because they had to go do homework or their mom wanted them home or whatnot and sure. they're like hey will you just film this real quick just cl click this button and hold the camera and don't move I'm like okay and just like feeling the camera in my hand I was like oh this is sweet and, you know, fast forward three years, I would still hang out with them and, and be friends with them and do things like that. And I took, like, one class in high school on video production, still very different of the career field I'm in now. Um, and so nothing had really sparked there. But what had sparked is, like, I would use my phone and, like, try and make things with my little iPhone 4. I bought, like, a case for it that supposedly made the camera lens better, things like that. And, and that was fun. But it still wasn't the same as having like an actual camera. Um, and then when I went to college, I decided I was going to buy a camera. And from there, kind of slowly progressed and got into that field. And um, I guess where I went to college kind of expedited that process even a little bit more. Are you going to now later, we're going to talk about the West Point versus BYU. But are you talking about your West Point experience and that? Yeah. Why did that take you into photography? Yeah, so, well, for one, I was, like, debating between West Point and BYU, and I was like, if I go to BYU, I got to pay tuition, or I could buy a camera and go to West Point. And I mean, that that wasn't the deal breaker, of course, but <laughs> it was it was like I could do that because I don't have to pay tuition there. And so I bought a camera when I went there and started, you know, taking senior pictures for those who were graduating and other people just, like, occasionally – and I got involved with a, a club called Cadet Media Group. Mm. Um, and they were still very like, um, not what I do now as far as sports, but um, the the rivalry between Army Navy is ridiculous. Oh and I don't know if anyone's ever seen them, but um, they have spirit videos that go out and they make the Army Navy spirit videos are ridiculous, like to the point where they'll send cadets to... Um, to Navy and like steal stuff like Billy the Goat, like things like that. It's over the top of an a rivalry that is so fun to be a part of. And so those were fun projects to be along the lines of where we were scripting and storytelling and trying to create things. Um, but at, at West Point, um, occasionally we had times to work in sports events, more for like documenting for like public affairs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that kind of led me down that path. And what ultimately happened is I really liked the sports realm. I'm a big sports guy myself, but I'm not good enough to play at the next level. What are the sports you enjoyed? Uh, lacrosse is what I grew up playing. Wow. And um, now, where did you grow up? Here in Utah. Okay. I grew up in Highland, Utah. Okay. Um, and and East Coast lacrosse is a whole new level compared to out here in the West. And Army had a great uh, great program the years I was there, so it was fun to be a part of uh, following them. But a lot of my fellow cadets uh, that were still kind of like me we would find ways not necessarily get out of military things but if you didn't have to do them you didn't want to do them <laughs> and so they would be managers for teams so a couple of um, my fellow cadets uh, in my company were uh, managers for the women's lacrosse team so basically they would you know hand out waters at practice they'd be there they'd watch film they'd film practice and and help the teams the best they could but I didn't want to necessarily be a water boy for a team to get out of walking around for an hour with a rifle <laughs> and I kind of had talked to them a bunch and was helping work with them but still providing footage with for public affairs that we needed and mostly photos but could work with the civilian side of um, social and and kind of recruiting side just for kind of I kind of meshed myself with the two so that way I could shoot more and so I got to a point where I was shooting all the time with them where I was at hockey instead of, you know, going to some class meeting I had at seven or whatever. I've got an admission to make, you know, because I served a mission down in Central America. When I was there, it was four countries, starting at Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. 
And Panama, every missionary wanted to go to Panama because they had a, a tax-free zone in the Panama Canal Zone, in the Canal Zone. And so if you went there, everybody wanted to buy a camera. Now, this was a long time ago, you know, so we had, you had to pull that film through the camera, but I bought, you know, top of the line Olympus OM2 camera back in the 1970s. And I was so proud of that. And, and there's, there's a joy about capturing something. And now here years, I mean, decades later, I'm able to, to look at those and share those with other people. And it's a blast. In fact, we even scanned all those pictures and they can upgrade the color content to way, to the way it was. So anyway, it's, it's fun that you have been able to do that from the beginning, but I have a question. How did you get to BYU from West Point? Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. Kind of full circle moment when I was deciding between the two. I mean, they're both known as very lax schools where there are no rules and, you know, where, you know, everything goes, right? Yeah, for sure. No, no partying, nothing. <laughs> um, but, but how did you go from West Point, tough school, you have to be appointed to get there. Right. All the way to BYU. Tell me, tell me the process, your trail. The- yeah. So, um, to make a long story short with filming with them, um, a lot of their creatives were leaving at West Point. And mm. so I was able to say, Hey, I have what you need and you have what I need, which was give me authorization to work with you and I can help you. So in a way I was doing a lot of work for free. At for West them. Point. Yeah. And um, they were going to send me to Army, Navy wrestling. And I was like, well, I want to go home for spring break. We don't have that many breaks. Um, And then while I was home on spring break, COVID hit and we never went back. Oh. And so that was kind of like the end of my West Point filming. And I was like, well, darn, now what? Um, But also I did know that I was going to go on a mission. And um, basically I thought I was going to go back to summer training, you know, early June and kept getting kicked down the road of when. Before going on your mission? Yeah, but. Um, the timing of my training kept getting kicked down the road, but all my stuff was still there. I just went home for spring break. So, um, finally they decided to bring us all back after going back. Um, like we stayed at home, went online, did that whole, um, shenanigans with school. That was terrible. I don't think anyone learned anything. Zoom. Fellow cadets or full beards, you know, like it was just, it was a very interesting time that no one really knew what to do with. Right. And finally, they decided they were going to bring all of us back um, in like cohorts of like the next three days. And they would test everyone on site. And if you tested positive, you'd go quarantine. And if you didn't, you'd go back to your room. Finally, I finally got pro- out processed, but it took them a long time because of COVID and some other circumstances that they basically sent me home on a release that they would kind of send someone to go home for a funeral. Um, but they sent me home on Saturday. I got home Saturday. And I started my mission Monday and there was talk that I was going to start my mission out there. And I'm like, I don't think that's a good idea because a, the only clothes I have here is military uniforms. People in my MTC district online would be like, what is going on? My roommates would be probably saying very foul words in the back, not the most spiritually driven. Um, but luckily they were able to get me home, but I was still technically in the army for the first six months of my mission. So it was very unique, different experience than I think a lot of people have had, but Finally was out process, finished up my mission, came home, and then I had this window where I needed to decide if I wanted to go back to West Point or mm-hmm. or not. Um, but I decided I was like, I really like filming sports, and I on my mission even, I would film a ton. I made silly videos to I would somewhat call professional videos about missionary work and um, really wanted to pursue that. And so when I got home, I applied across the nation actually to a ton of universities, and West Point had an open creative spot, so... Friends and family would tease me that I would go back there as a civilian work. <laughs> but um, I had a- applied um, to even, you know, the Red School up north and lots of other schools. Ooh, and, what, careful now. I know, seriously. And and th- there was a few I really wanted to go to, never heard back from. Um, and some I got interviews with, but BYU, it's an interesting circumstance because BYU is not one of the schools I applied to because they didn't look like they had a job opening. Um, but my dad um, had randomly just felt we should check again for a job opportunity. And BYU was there and was like, what in the world? And so we applied, meaning I applied, but he helped me um, to find that job listing that was buried. And cool. 
that's kind of how I ended up at BYU. What year did you start doing videography? For BYU? At BYU. Uh, last August. So I've been, I've been at BYU for just over a year. All right. So I've seen some video, you know, that they'll produce, I think, before maybe every game or before the season. And some of these are really compelling. They are so fun to watch. And I mean, you catch the perfect clip, you, you attach the perfect music and it just lifts you up. Like, Oh, I can't wait for this game. Is that what you're involved with? Tell me about creating that. Yeah. So kind of, kind of along the lines of what I deal with on a day to day basis is, you know, games are, content that's given to us to you know produce and keep social going in a sense i almost look at my job as a way of recruiting like through social pages of we're creating those hype pieces where if you you know were in your prime not saying you're not but ready ready I to come I'm play still in my prime ready to come play i thought i was going to get a call from uh, coach sataki this year because I saw that they needed me but no i'm kidding i'm <laughs> but, very, you know, very much kidding but but if you were a, a senior, junior in high school, and you're like wanting to play at the next level, and you're mm -hmm. like deciding between certain schools. Like the emotion that we want to pull from our social pages, like if if you land on BYU soccer, football, or basketball, and you're like, you know what, that looks like a university I want to play for. Yeah. Um, whether that's the hype ups before the game, that's like, yeah, BYU is awesome. Like that's a great program to play for. Or in the off season, you know, you've seen all this content about the the players that are on the team that are doing day in the life or yeah you know random question boards where you really get to know the players you're like that looks like a fun group of people that I could see myself being with Let, th that's really cool because I can see where that would become a tool for recruiting of of high school athletes I have a question do you remember I mean you weren't there then it might have even been during your mission but do you remember Tyler Algier all right do you remember when we threw an interception and the guy was running all the way back, but Tyler Algier, Algier runs behind the the defensive. I think it was a linebacker. And uh, do you remember that? I've seen so many really cool videos made of that. I, so I wasn't I wasn't a part of the team here, but all of our social guys, no one got the shot for that. Really? So if you see anything about that, it's always the broadcast clips. Interesting. Because everyone missed whether it was people in the way or didn't see it coming, whatnot. So it's kind of interesting like with our line of work is we always have a fallback which let is me the interrupt broadcast. you then because if it's from the broadcast clip a lot of times the broadcast clips aren't aren't done in real high what is it dick pixels or yeah you know, like quality yeah the quality isn't there i mean is that a problem relative to using a camera <sighs> it depends <clears throat> it depends with with football I, games the quality is going to be a lot better than like soccer okay um and it, it depends on stadiums and lighting and things like that. But a lot of the broadcast footage I work with is terrible. Really? But Just in curious. a sense, I almost like how bad it looks compared to our footage because it makes our stuff look that much better. <laughs> so Good. It's Good. fun. Hey, Kate, all I can tell you is as a player, when you first walk into that locker room and your jersey's hanging in that locker and you see your number and your name on the back of the jersey, and then when you're at the game and the band's playing, the crowd is already humming, you know, the feeling that you get as a player running out on that field is amazing. Now, I assume you being a videographer that you've got some of the same kind of passions going through you as you prepare for the game, as you sense it. Tell me what the feeling is, what the preparations are that you do before a game. Yeah, that's a good question. For me personally, I think one of the greatest um, feelings is that I feel like I'm a part of the team. Like when you're able to come close with the athletes and they know you personally, they know to look for you or or want you know to be in front of your camera, give you the sound bites that you know will work good for. Are video. you right there on the sideline with the team generally? Yeah, generally. I mean, it depends on which sports, but right. for, for soccer, and I'm like this football, year. Right. Yeah. Um, for soccer this year, it's been fun with, you know, going to practice and seeing them work hard. And so, in a sense, it's been fun to be kind of right along the side of the team through their journey. And that's, that's one of the most rewarding things uh, 
about videography, photography that I think I, I failed to hit on of why I've started as a passion is that it, nothing is greater than seeing someone smile from a product I've delivered them. And that was one of the things that really got me going at West Point was like certain athletes from lacrosse or basketball would walk up to me and be like, hey man, can you make me a video? Really? And, and they would ask me that because they saw what I made someone else that happened to be my roommate during basic training. And so like, that's kind of what got started and that's why I enjoy it so much. And so when you as a player running out on the field feeling that, I'm feeling the same way because I feel like I'm right that's there with thought. you. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. And, and that's what's been it's just, hey, it's so a, fun. It's a community feeling, you know, because right. as a fan you feel it too. Right. And I remember, <laughs> I remember my last year, you know, and I was injured. And so I had to sit up in the stand. No, my last year when I was injured, I was down on the field with crutches. But then I take my master's degree and I'm up in the stand watching my team, you know, here, I'm no longer an athlete. That was the hardest thing in the world to not be involved. And here you're involved on a daily basis. I think that's cool. Right. I, I think a lot of our job, um, is all about like, I guess what I'm trying to say is a lot of our job that I find gratitude in is like creating something and seeing an athlete smile of when or giving them a memory to look back on when they mm -hmm. scored a goal scored a touchdown or caught you know an amazing pass hit the game winning three point like having that come from me to show other than you know what's going around ESPN and the broadcast but like a different angle that shows the perspective that is is different that's one of my favorite things about uh, working in sports is providing a, a different look than what you would see on TV. Like if I want to go watch BYU football game, I'll turn on my TV to ESPN and I'll watch the game. And so that's where I like our social side of things is that we can provide a different look that not every fan has the ability to see because we're on you the do. field. You do. I assume that those videos pre-game in the stadium are produced by you guys too. Yeah. You know, where you've got the guys making their little stances and looking. But that's fun. I mean, you feel like, you see the player not just with his helmet and the face mask and everything, but but you see him in in kind of personally. And that's cool. Thanks for doing that. Um, but you also do this for businesses and for musicians. Do you want to express anything about that? Is that the same feeling or Yeah. I mean the feeling's always always the same when I can provide a product and or a video that will further them as a person or their business and see them smiling from what I've created. So working with certain musicians who, or, you know, friends, whatever the case is, bands, um, companies, whether it's clothing, energy drinks, certain things like that. It's fun to say, Hey, like I've created this, they're happy and then can potentially see their business grow, whether that's, you know, I think the mood with everything's going to change though, right? I mean, if you were video doing video for something that's more serious versus something that's really exciting right. versus something that's funny or something that's just interesting, I, how do you bring your passion, your, your personality? How do you, how do you present whatever you're videoing in that light, in that context is what, what things are you looking for? Uh, the biggest, the biggest advice I've been told is, um, in general, like when we're covering sports, like the content's given to us in a way. And so the biggest advice I've been given is look for moments over edits, mm. um, and, and things that are very emotion driven. And I think that's what we like to pull from, from video and photo is sharing emotion. And so when we're working with things that might be more serious, if you can drive, and produce and pull that emotion from somebody, that's a successful product. Good for you. Awesome. You know, everybody in their life, at first we were going to call this the playbook. You know, we we're going to talk about plays in football, but plays in everything, plays in soccer, plays behind the scenes in what you do. Um, what, what are the things, maybe one or two things in your life that have driven you, whether it's been a difficulty, something, some adversity that you've overcome. Tell me, tell me something about you that's made, that's brought you to this point in your life. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing that comes to mind is I lost my mom to cancer when I was 10. Mm. Um, and how many brothers and sisters did you have? 
at the time it was just me and my little sister. Um, and you're living in Highland. Yep. And she was a year and a half mm. at the time. I was 10. So we were How very young. How long did she have cancer? Um, I mean, she's kind of... I mean, had, did this happen all of a sudden or was it over a per- period of time? She had thyroid cancer growing up. Um, and was she, was she in remission or no? I, I mean, she had thyroid cancer and had healed from that. Excuse me. Um, and and had healed from that. Um, but I would say how the leukemia leukemia came to be was pretty out of the out of the blue. Kind of like she had gotten really sick, and my dad was just kind of like you know. And was he and, devastated? And my dad works in the medical field and can tell oh. the difference when it's a cold or something serious. And so he went to go get checked out and, and figured that um, her red blood cell count was absurdly low or high. I don't remember which one, but um, knew something was up and so got things figured out. And she was fighting for quite some time, honestly. She was in the hospital, um, admitted to the ICU. She was in and out of the ICU. And then at one point she came home um, I don't know the exact dates cause I was pretty young, but, um, this was all like through Christmas in the winter. And luckily we have an incredible neighborhood. Like, I mean, after school, it got to a point where I, our whole neighborhood had created a sheet that it was like, Hey, you're going to this house after school. This person's providing dinner. Like it, it was incredible. The love felt from just like our neighborhood and like true neighbors who truly felt like they cared was incredible. Um, but it was hard growing up in like the fourth grade, like have in fourth and fifth grade having to go to so and so random's person's house. Yeah, I mean, it's like you're being babysat right. as a young teenager, or yeah. And and part of it was my dad had to work, but yeah. then after work, my dad's at the hospital, and so um, this went on for a long time. My mom actually came home in March, and we celebrated Christmas in March, so our Christmas tree was still up. Obviously, we didn't care to take it down because we had other things to deal with but my mom came home for a little bit and then after she had come home declined pretty rapidly went back into the ICU and then had shortly passed away in May so how does that affect young Cade yeah um I mean it's no easy task losing a loved one especially your mom um definitely I would say a lot of the things I try and find motivation is like through that in the sense of like, would my mom be proud of this? And there's probably a lot of things I've done. She's How do you remember her? There are probably a lot of things you've done <laughs> that she would. But you know, that's all of us, isn't it? I mean, yeah. none of us is perfect. But d- tell me about the pride that she, maybe something in your life that you've accomplished already because you're young. Um, so there are many more things in front of you. Yeah. But what, what are maybe some of your, your accomplishments or the things you've over, overcome that your mom would be proud of? One, one organization that comes to mind is called Be The Match, where they try and find... Be The Match? Yeah. They're a nonprofit organization that tries to find matches for bone marrow transplants. Oh. Um, so I ran my Eagle project with Be The Match um, at Nitro World Games at the Ricicle Stadium. Wow. I don't remember exact numbers, but we got a lot of people to sign up for the registry. Um, and it's cool to see someone that you help sign up on the registry say, oh, hey, I just got a phone call that I was a match for so-and-so out in Texas. Um, because they potentially are able to save that person's life. And that's one thing that has been super fun to kind of live through is seeing other people's willingness to help other people. All right, so that leads me to another question. Maybe this is off topic or some tangent, but giving up bone marrow, how do you do that? A lot of people think it's a very invasive, scary process. Yeah. But they can actually pull it from IVs. They'll try multiple ways. The worst one everyone thinks of is where they like actually drill into your hip. Yeah. But you can get it from the same process as kind of giving blood. And then do you have to take like a week or month off to replenish the bone marrow or... What happens? I'm not too, <laughs> I'm not too researched on it, but that's, that's... but I don't believe so. I believe okay. it's it's only pretty bad when you're getting drilled into. Wow. So no, but what a great thing! I have a very good friend who gave a kidney to someone who a relative that was closely matched, and you know, so now he's living with one kidney, and but he saved the life right of his relative. Good for you. 
And wow, what a what an interesting thing. Your father, how's your father? How did your father overcome that difficulty? Yeah, for um, for a while it was difficult because he had two kids to take care of and he had to work. Um, and so luckily we have awesome neighbors who were able to take us in who one of them was my best friend growing up and their family really embraced us. And so I laugh all the time and make jokes that I have like six moms. Um, and they truly were a great role in my life to raise me. Um, and I got to hang out with my best friend while doing it. That's cool. But my dad, yeah, I mean, it was, it was definitely hard for him at first because what do you do with two kids and a full-time job? Where do you put them? What do you do? Um, but was able to happily get remarried and um, to a widower as well, which was, I think, the perfect situation. Well, um, her first husband had passed away from Lou Gehrig's disease. Were you still in the home when they remarried? Yeah. So this was um, shortly after. Was that hard for you, you know, to accept this new lady in your home? At, at first, I think it, it was, but I was so young that I didn't really know. I think if I was my age now, even, you know, five years younger, I think I'd be like. But how do you accept her now? My mom. Um, now I, she's part of the family. Like she's, she, and she's made it very clear that she's, she's another like, mom to you, right? Yeah. And she's made it clear that she's like, I will never replace your mom, but I want to fill that role. And okay. and she's been awesome. Thank you. And my, my mom and my stepmom and my dad have two kids together and I've always wanted a brother. And so now I have a little brother and, um, another little sister and they're just fun little hood rats running around <laughs> the house. Can they keep the house so loud? That's cool. Fun. That's cool. All right, now I understand also that you've run a marathon. How do you prepare for a marathon? Um, to be honest, I didn't prepare like I should have, but it's been a goal that I've always set to do. I've, For some reason, I've always wanted to run the Boston Marathon, and to get there, you have to run a normal marathon and qualify at a certain time. Mm -hmm. And so that was one goal that... I had seen other friends do and run and complete, and I was like, I just want to do it. And maybe what kind of sparked it was my dad and I did this thing called a 50-20. I've heard of that. Where you do 50 miles under 20 hours. And yeah. that was not necessarily running. Like, we were kind of fast walking, ran a little bit, and walked. Honestly, it's probably one of the most emotional experiences I've ever felt and for myself. Like, really? Like, personally, like... When, when did you feel that emotion? Mile 24. Mile 24, and it's a 26.2? Yeah. Or, okay. Well, maybe it was closer to 23 because my I'm like halfway Is through. Is it at the point you knew you were going to make it? And When, well, when, uh, when did you feel this emotion? Yeah. that Like the whole the whole race, I felt completely fine, which is weird. I'm like 18 miles in. I'm like, do 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 woo. Like not tired. Like I felt just um, amazing. And everyone says it like mile 18, 19, you hit the wall where it's like, that's where everyone is like done. And I just blaze past it. I'm at like mile 20, 21. I'm like the wall, never heard of her. Right. Like, I'm like, this is easy. And I hit mile 22, 23. And I like break down crying. Like, I'm like, I'm going to do this. But it was in this, it was like just so crazy that I actually could do it. And the reason why is I had set a goal for three hours, 30 minutes. Mm. and every 13 or not every 13 it was like every I can't remember exactly but they had a text thing when your bid went through that would send you your pace so I would check my watch and I'd have a text from a number and it was like hey your pace is this to finish at this time and it was well above my goal and so I was like you mean below your goal yes well time, yeah yeah well below my goal and so I was just excited that I was going to crush my goal and um, mile 23 hits and there are people at this point you've caught up to the half marathon the 5k the 10k and whatnot where there are people in front of me I'm like how are they in front of me and so it was like mentally I'm like how are these people in front of me and not to like judge them by their you know cover or appearance or whatnot sure but there are people sitting down on the curbs there are people passed out there's one guy that's hit his head and bleeding you know like I'm just like I'm not gonna finish this my toe started to kill oh, gee. and then so I'm mentally, like that and then I'm like a... looking at myself I'm three miles away and you're really not gonna finish this you know wow. what I mean like I was like kick it into gear like wow. finally I finished and I came across and I like I, I one of the things too I documented on my phone I like filmed and like I can't while you're running yeah and I couldn't even I couldn't even like say my time without getting a little choked up 
So I my goal was three hours, 30 minutes, and I beat it by 12 minutes. And Good for you. And that was my first marathon. To qualify for Boston, I got to run at 18 minutes faster. But for and a start, that was phenomenal for me. That is so cool. Thank you, Cade. I had a similar experience. Of course, now I'm an older adult. You know, I have a family. In we your prime. Lived, what's that? In your prime. I'm still in my prime. In fact, today I'm still in my prime. I could go out and catch one-handed passes still. I just run like half the speed. <laughs> but seriously, I, I loved bicycling. I had a big knee injury my senior year in college. And so bicycling is what kept me alive. I just, and, and it was a similar type thing as your marathon, but we lived in Farmington, New Mexico, which is up in the northwest corner of New Mexico, not far from Durango, Colorado. So Durango, Colorado, they had the, uh, what they call it? The Iron Horse Race. And this is a race that races against the, the railroad train that goes from Durango, Colorado, up to Silverton, Colorado. It's a 62-mile 60, course that goes up two giant peaks, 17,000. That's probably not right. I think it was like 13 or 14,000 feet elevation. So you climbed about 13 or 14,000 feet during this bike ride, and it was grueling. And I didn't know if I'd make it. I'm serious. It was cold. It was windy. There were times when it was snowing. Long story short, I get up over the second peak, and at that moment, everything's downhill to Silverton. You can just ride your brakes down, you know. And I started crying. I was like, what's the matter? I mean, I'm not supposed to get emotional. Just This is just a bike ride. But exactly. you, you accomplished your goal, and it was kind of like, wow, this eye-opening experience of this adversity that I've been suffering all day long, and now I made it. And and there's some great feeling about that. Yeah, how did when when you finished, were you like, I'm never doing this again? Or how did you feel? After? No, no, I I felt like I could do this again. Because I'll tell you right and now. And I'd be better prepared. Like I finished, I went home, I was like sore. Like I came across the finish line. Oh, I was stopped sore. stopped running. Yeah. And I like could hardly walk. And I'm just munching all the food they had there, just putting calories in my body. But after I remember looking, I got home, looked over at my, my best friend and I was like, yeah, I could do an Ironman. You know, like, I'm excited. I want to do an Ironman. And, I, and then I look at myself and have a reality check. I'm like, why Why did I say that? Like, I don't want to do that. Right. But it was like our bodies crave adversity. There's no growth in a comfort zone. And so, like, if I'm just chilling on the couch and I'm comfortable, I'm not growing, like you said. So that's one of the biggest things that, like, kind of drove me to complete my marathon is I was like, if I'm sitting on my couch, I'm not growing. And it, And I think it was more of a mental than a physical for me to do a marathon. It was that I had set a goal. I always feel like I cut myself short, sell myself short, and I wanted to do it for myself, no one else. I wanted to set something and actually accomplish something that I had set to do. That's cool, Cade. In a very young body, you've done a lot of cool stuff and accomplished many things. What else do we need to say, you know, to finish this off, Cade? What What is your... For Ooh. our Beyond the Game, which is typically about talking about the stories beyond or behind the game or the season or whatever, tell us something that we need to know about you or about something you've witnessed, particularly if it's about BYU or the Cougars yeah. or whatever. I don't know. I think I think my biggest takeaway from life in general, and I probably learned this on my mission, is just that there's more than face value. There's more than the game. There's more than... And that's one of my favorite things about working in the career field I work in, the people I've met on my mission and in my life is that there's such a unique and cool story to every person. Everyone grew up differently. Everyone has a different past history. And it's fun for me to learn that. It's also fun for me to document that when, when it's available to Can me. Can I, I'm not trying to interrupt you because I want you to finish, but I want to witness, I'm going to be a witness here because I'm one of those guys that when mom or your grandma or or your wife wants to set up for pictures, oh, do we have to? Come on, we're busy playing games or watching a game, whatever. And then years, a decade later or more, you go back to those pictures 
and you captured it. You captured the feeling. And we can go back and look at those, those pictures, which maybe 20 years ago I was complaining about. And now they bring tears to my eyes because you remember that emotion. You remember that feeling of where you were, who you were with. And, and so anyway, thank you for finish, finish the thought. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. I guess you. that's kind of my biggest thing that I've really enjoyed about life is getting to meet new people from my camera. I've met all sorts of people. Cool. And it's my camera's taking me places around the world, even that I never thought it would. And that is honestly one of my favorite things about my career field. Well, Cade, thank you for sharing what you've brought today. Thank you for being here. And you keep going. Thanks I for mean, having me. Oh, you're very welcome. Hope to hope to see you again. And I hope to enjoy a lot more of your talents because they do. They they bring it to my heart when I when I see my cougars or whoever, you know, accomplishing what they do. So thank you for what you do. Thank you. Thank you.